So good morning, uh, namaste, and uh, welcome in Thiel India at Almadalan Future Urbanism Seminar Series. Uh, standing beside me is a man who wears many hats, uh, but today he is uh, wearing the hat of a cultural researcher and a professor. Uh, that's Professor Uwe Rothstrom, uh, professor with uh, the Department of Anthropology and Ethnology at uh, the Uppsala University Campus, Scotland. Well, warm welcome to um, Uppsala University Campus Scotland. This is a small campus and the most effective and productive one. This is one of seven, seven campuses within Uppsala University, which is, as you may know, is Sweden's oldest and largest and perhaps uh, best university. <laughs> no, I didn't say the last part. No, no, sorry. Uh, uh, with here, a number of uh, institutions are represented and uh, we together are now quickly transforming this into a hub for multidisciplinary sustainability studies and for education and collaboration with, with civil society in various forms and around the topic of sustainability. That's, this has happened from below. It's not a decision from deans or rectors, but from the staff itself. So we have developed, are now fastly developing into a, a hub for sustainability studies. The ultimate goal of Uppsala University, you might not be aware of it, but the ultimate goal is, for, and for most universities in the world actually, is to contribute to a better world. That is uh, the, the ultimate goal. So why are we here today? First of all, because of just that, to try to make the world at least a little better. We have brought together here a number of people from different corners of society, researchers, innovators, developers, administrators, and an ambassador for six successive seminars on different issues around sustainability. What we will do uh, during the seminars here today is to try to connect the urban needs and innovative spirit, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial energy of India with the ideas, robust ideas of sustainability and resilience, technologies and business models from Sweden and the Nordic world, of course, at large. And look at prospects of collaboration and uh, cooperation from uh, th at least three different perspectives, um, which is around technology for sustainable solutions, of course, lifestyle as uh, one of the keys to uh, sustainability, and especially urban uh, issues, urban sustainability. So within these tr three perspectives, we will bring to the table here four seminars each on a specific theme on mobility and transport, housing, energy and water, food and health. And to that, uh, two overarching sem uh, uh, seminars on, uh, on issues. Uh, the first one considering what can we do, do for sustainability. And lastly, turning the question around what can sustainability do for us. So this, uh, in this uh, room today, we will go on until around half past three, including coffees and um, uh, lunch. A, a lunch, <laughs> yes, in the middle. So this seminar is an initiative of the research program Future Urbanisms, which is run here in uh, Campus Gotland. I'll come back to that in just a short while. Uh, for supporting this seminars, set of seminars, we gratefully thank Ambassador of India in Sweden, which will you meet in a second. And then uh, there are also representatives of Make in India, who has made it possible to invite Indian colleagues, specialists in various fields that you will meet during the day. And together, of course, with a number of Swedish researchers and specialists from Uppsala University, from Chalmers, companies like Sustainable in Innovation, Better Shelter, Matters Group, India Unlimited, Sweden India Business Council, Region Gotland, IVL, Sweeker, Sweden Food Tech, Technique for the Target, and on. Our moderator is Rupali Mera. She's a, Hello. Uh, yes, please. <laughs> Actually, I will tell you, say that Rupali Mera is a celebrated first class journalist from Bombay now, living in Visby. <laughs> yes, I thought so. <laughs> But uh, now it's an uh, honor to introduce to you the Ambassador of India in Sweden, Her Excellency Monica Kapil Mota, who will now give an inaugural speech opening these sets of seminars. Most welcome to you and most welcome to you.
गुड मॉर्निंग नमस्ते थैंक यू प्रोफेसर थैंक यू रूपाली मे आई सी हाउ डिलाइटेड आई एम टू बी हियर दिस मॉर्निंग एंड वॉट अ बेटर प्लेस दैन गॉटलैंड एंड विस्पी टू हैव द सेमिनार दिस इज माई थर्ड विजिट टू विस्पी इन द लास्ट टू ईयर्स and i must say that every time i come here i am stunned by the sheer beauty of the place it is incredibly beautiful and you're all very fortunate many of you who live in visby are very fortunate to be living here those who've come from outside please make the most of your days here because it is incredibly satisfying and incredibly beautiful um also a place which is culturally rooted technologically oriented with diverse communities i'm told and creative and innovative because we know about uh this genius professor who's sitting here with us who is uh, not only uh, an expert on the subject that we discussed today but who is an incredible musician and he has been involved in music related projects that have been pioneering and i think it it's very interesting how we connect scientists and music sometimes but maybe there is a a universe design to it that that is the way it's meant to be so uh, the diversity is something that can be said about india too because india is a diverse land and um, uh, with all our different cultures and subcultures and sub identities and religions and communities and uh, languages ethnicities uh india's diversity is something that uh, you would all have heard about um i hope that the coming week in almadalan is going to be fruitful for all of us and that um from your hectic schedule we will all be able to uh, find a little time to explore this uh, very lovely place um so for me it's a great pleasure to be addressing this uh, inaugural seminar in dert almadolan on the future of urbanisms uh this is the first of its kind of business seminar which was being organized by the embassy of india in association with india unlimited and the prestigious upsala university gotland campus i'd like to take this opportunity first to compliment india unlimited sanju malhotra upsala university professor onstrom and uh rupali and swami for this tremendous meaningful initiative i'd also like to thank shoma banerji uh of the cii who has come all the way from india to participate in the seminar and to tell us more about uh the subject uh before i actually start talking about the subject i have been asked to make an inaugural address i thought i'd share with you a very small anecdote i was in december last year in india with my son who lives in delhi uh with his grandparents and his father and i because of my assignment in sweden and stationed in stockholm so i i reunited with the family in december and there was a lot of talk my son turned 28 years old and there was a lot of talk that he should get married now 28 is in india a good age for a young boy to be getting married and uh, his grandmother was very keen uh, she kept talking about his marriage and the fact that she wanted to see his uh, children her gra- her great grandchildren and uh, we just kept talking about it and suddenly my son said cuz my mother in law kept talking about how it was important to get a daughter in the family because you know we just don't have enough girls in the family we have too many men and she said i hope that your first child is going to be a daughter and we're going to bring her up like a princess i'm going to start collecting sarees for her jewelry silver all that and in india it's something which is traditional that when a child is born you start preparing for their future and you start collecting things for them and all these collectibles actually are uh, all material things and my son suddenly went quiet and he told his grandmother 
you want to bring up my daughter like a princess. You want to keep her in a palace and you want to give her all the fineries of the world. Well, when she steps out of the palace, what kind of air is she going to breathe? Is she going to be confronted with garbage dumps that we see in Delhi? Is she going to be able to drive in the city of Delhi without having to face traffic jams which can keep you stranded in the city for three hours? Or can we give her a better life? Can we give her fresh air to breathe, pure water to drink? You know, the conversation went in a different direction altogether. And my son actually told uh, all of us that he didn't plan to live in Delhi if he gets married and he, wants, he plans to bring up a family. He will move to Bangalore or to Hyderabad or one of the cities in the south of India which are less polluted. It was pretty shocking to hear that because of, obviously our ancestral home is Delhi. But I think the message went down very well also to the older generation that the thinking among the new generation in India is very different and that we are very seriously looking at some of the challenges that are confronting us in our cities and that we have to find solutions to these challenges. So I wanted to tell you this little story because this is something that we encountered and uh, I'm very proud of the fact that my son thought this way and very proud of the fact that when uh, a helper in the house is running a tap, he would go and shout at him and say, come on, turn off the tap. You can't keep it running because, you know, water is precious. Uh, you may have seen pictures of, um, I think, Leonardo DiCaprio had recently tweeted a picture about Chennai where um, there are these women who are at a well with all these colorful um, vessels, but no water, not a drop of water in the well. And this is the city of Chennai, which has gone dry completely. And, uh, and please remember, there are millions and millions of people living in the city of Chennai, and there is no water there. So um, there are these challenges, and we are here to talk about many of these. Uh, there are stakeholders here, I know, from the government, from media, from um, industry from the corporate world. There are think tanks and uh, we have the CII represented here and uh, we're glad that the, some of the finest brains are sitting here today to talk about these issues and to see how we can find solutions to these challenges. Um, this seminar series of Il India at Almadal and Future Urbanisms, this is, you would have seen, packed with subjects which are very relevant to India in particular today, and I'm sure also to Sweden, because Sweden, I have always felt, and we all know, is a global leader when it comes to innovation, technologies, green technologies, state-of-the-art, cutting-edge technologies that can actually change the world we're living in. So um, uh, we connect with, through the seminar, we connect with our uh, urban needs in India, we also connect with um, uh, and talk about the innovative spirit of India and the young generation in India in particular and the entrepreneur entrepreneurial energy of India. Uh, some of the very robust ideas of sustainability and resilience which come from Sweden and uh, as I mentioned, your state-of-the-art technologies and business models that you follow. And, um, not only Sweden, but the entire Nordic world. Sustainable urban development uh, has been identified as uh, one of the most important potential areas of cooperation between Sweden and India. And this is uh, particularly the focus of uh, a, a joint statement which had come out between Prime Minister Stefan Löfven and Prime Minister Modi. Uh, when uh, Mr. Lovain had visited India in 2016. And then this sort of a commitment at the highest level was again cemented in a joint declaration that we brought out uh, on India-Sweden Innovation Partnership and the joint action plan that was adopted during the visit of our Prime Minister to Sweden last April, April 2018. Uh, so uh, cooperation in this area of sustainable urban development has an enormous potential for both countries. We look at Sweden's expertise, uh, we look at India's development needs, the size of our market, um, we look at India's uh, um, 
um, very skilled workforce, and you'd, you'd be surprised when you get to hear of the kind of startups that are coming up in India now with the young generation and the kind of brains that are going into creating very easy and cheap solutions, affordable, adaptable solutions in India for uh, some of the problems that we face. Uh, all this dovetails very well into the uh, flagship initiatives that have been taken by the government of India um, over the last five years or so. Uh, these initiatives, one of them is called Make in India, which is about producing in India, but ecologically friendly production. Digital India, uh, digitization, which obviously uh, is also climate friendly. And Skill India, how do we ensure that 65% of India's 1.3 billion people who are young, below the age of 35, are going to be skilled to face the future challenges? Uh, there is a very special initiative called Clean India, Swachh Bharat, which is about you know, getting rid, rid of uh, you know, waste management systems, garbage disposal systems, cleanliness and hygiene. And smart cities, of course, a very important initiative which connects directly with our um, subject today. Amrit, which is about bringing pure drinking water to our villages and our cities. Namami Gange, which is about cleaning the rivers, particularly the Ganges. Um, so, of course, India's development agenda is reflected in the sustainable development goals that we all know about. We in India are tirelessly pursuing the objective of eliminating poverty. Uh, and there are many, many means of empowering the poor and several new initiatives that have been taken to try and find simple solutions like provide toilets, provide uh, cooking gas to women who've been using fossil fuels, um, and um, for skill development. Uh, we are progressing very well on the uh, education of the girl child, which is a very special initiative close to the heart of our prime minister. Uh, women empowerment, bringing more and more women in uh, the grassroots level in politics and uh, uh, in the corporate world, in every sphere, in fact. Provision for housing, for power, for water, for health, hygiene, sanitation, uh, while preserving the environment, uh, including the ocean ecosystem. You know, India is a peninsula and we're surrounded by, there is, of course, the Indian Ocean, the Bay of Bengal, and the Arabian Sea. Um, so all these are an intrinsic part of the overall development agenda of uh, the Indian government. Um, if we look at the acceleration of the economic boom in India, we look at the increased purchasing power of the people, the growing needs of our people, uh, the growing aspirations of the people, uh, increased demand, a huge flow into our cities and rapid urbanization, all these have put a huge pressure on the present infrastructure that we have. And uh, at the same time, while we are modernizing and developing our infrastructure, uh, we also have to keep in mind the fact that we've got to preserve our traditional water resources. We have to try and see that we don't cut our forests and that we try and uh, um, build or uh, uh, convert our existing cities into green cities and find sustainable energy solutions. There is a pressing demand for this transition from present infrastructure to sustainable infrastructure, which will be able to uh, help us move from our present uh, um, uh, cities and uh, uh, environment that we live in into uh, healthier and sustainable um, urban environment. Um, well, India needs smart cities that are sustainable and resilient and uh, can provide a better quality of life. This is a huge challenge. It's exciting, but it's also a great opportunity. So just to give you an idea of the magnitude of numbers, because in Sweden, with a population of 10 million, sometimes it's not easy to comprehend what's the magnitude of the challenge in India. Let me give you some examples. 
more than 55% of India's GDP comes from its cities. And it is estimated that close to 600 million Indians, 600 million Indians will be living in cities and over 70% of all economic activity will be happening in our cities by 2030. And uh, just to put 600 million people in the context of uh, you know, Sweden and uh, to give you the proportion to you, that is twice the current population of the United States of America. 68 Indian cities are expected to have a population of 1 million each. 68 Indian cities will have more than a million uh, people. And then there are other cities like Delhi uh, who have a population of, I think we are touching 22 million already in uh, the national capital region. Now, this 1 million is 20 times the current population of Gotland, 40 times the population of Visby. Uh, where we are all gathered here today and to discuss many of these issues connected with the future cities and urban uh, life in India. Now you can imagine the, the magnitude that we're talking about. So obviously apart from the fact that it's a huge challenge, please, we must always remember that it's also a mega economic opportunity that India offers as a market. And uh, many of the stakeholders might find that also very interesting that there's a lot of money to be made also in how we convert our cities into sustainable cities. And that if you're able to marry technology, bring in the right technologies, bring in the right minds, the brains, the vision, uh, the resources, uh, then, uh, as I said, it's a huge economic boom that we're talking about. Uh, to accommodate its people and to, grow, uh, to, to ensure that the economy grows, India will need a capital investment of about 1.2 trillion US dollars. But that's the big picture. Uh, the Indian big picture is also composed of several smaller pictures which have their unique growth trajectories. Uh, it is by looking at these smaller pictures that we can create an urban framework that is smart, sustainable and resilient. A framework that is as flexible as it is robust and intensely focused on providing a great quality of life to urban Indian citizens. Uh, I might mention that there was an MOU, a Memorandum of Understanding on Sustainable Urban Development that was signed during the visit of our, prime, uh, pr our president to Sweden in 2015. And this has got a very good framework uh, for taking forward this bilateral cooperation between India and Sweden. And uh, uh, this particular um, document that we have signed, it identifies uh, exchange of knowledge, sustainable and integrated urban planning and land use, integrated solid waste management, sustainable transport systems, water, sanitation management. So there are a lot of subjects that are part of uh, this MOU that envisages collaboration between not just the government but also research institutions and may I tell you there are several pilot projects that are already running in India thanks to India-Sweden cooperation and um, there's also a working group um, that was set up and it has met and it's talking and exploring the possibilities of cooperation in smart cities and to see how we can work together in transit-oriented urban development, air pollution control, waste management, and this includes solid waste management, waste water management, mining water management, waste to energy, and uh, district cooling, circular economy, e-mobility, renewable fuels. There's a lot of work that is actually happening at the moment, and I see Rupali sitting here, and I know that IVL is doing some great work in India. Uh, Pune has been adopted. Uh, part of Pune is going to be converted into a smart city uh, between, you know, uh, in, a, in a collaboration between India and Sweden. So that's really an example of how we are, we are working together with Sweden in the uh, lovely city of Pune, where there's a cluster of Swedish companies that have got production facilities, and uh, there is a Swedish avenue there. And now um, it's actually called Sveanagar, which, which means the Swedish city. So there is a Swedish city within the city of Pune, which is now being converted into a smart city. 
In India, we are focused on making our growth inclusive and sustainable. This is very important for us because there is still a large number of our population that lives below the poverty line. And uh, uh, even those who are above the poverty line need help. And there has to be state-driven programs and initiatives to ensure that they're given a better life and that our growth becomes inclusive and that um, um, our, uh, a majority of our population gets covered. And so uh, guided by India's commitment to a healthy planet and our nationally determined contributions as per the Paris Accord on Climate Change, we have pledged that by 2030, 40% of installed power generation capacity in India will be based on clean sources. And it's been decided that 175 gigawatt of renewable energy capacity will be installed by 2022. And this includes 100 gigawatt solar, 60 gigawatt wind, 10 gigawatt biopower, and 5 gigawatt from small hydro energy sources. So we have taken huge strides in rural electrification transforming rural India. In fact, India is now recognized by the International Energy Agency as one of the greatest success stories in bringing about rural access to energy in 2018. In renewable energy, we've become the sixth largest producer in the world. This and uh, also our initiative of the International Solar Alliance will enable India to, to be a pioneer in moving towards a global green economy. And this is our commitment for a green and sustainable future. So um, Rupali is here, and we need to, I need to conclude because we, we need to really move on. There are several other examples which I can quote in the course of the seminar. But I will conclude here and uh, thank you all for uh, your presence here today. And uh, also to, uh, to mention to you that uh, as one of the fastest growing economies of the world, one of the fastest growing large economies of the world, India is completely committed to meeting these challenges. But you can imagine the challenges for 1.3 billion people are not the same as challenges for a country which has a population of 10 million people. So there is the, you, the, the, the whole um, uh, magnitude of the challenges is something for us to see. It's, it's a vast, vast canvas. But as I said, every challenge is an opportunity and that we must make use of every opportunity. I greatly look forward to the discussions and the deliberations in this seminar series and so that we can all learn in the process and see how we can come up with some very interesting ideas that are going to benefit us, uh, both India and Sweden. So thank you again. Thank you all for inviting me here. It's been a real pleasure. And I greatly look forward to our discussions through the course of the day. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're going to get started with uh, Uwe's presentation. Uwe, what are you going to be speaking about? Yes. Uh, I will address um, now uh, a few questions around the need for culture and uh, social research on uh, and reflection concerning sustainable issues development and also reflect about a little bit of the role of, of di and the meaning of the notion of diversity. But starting with, of course, why are we here? Again, I would uh, like to underline that the ultimate uh, reason is to take at least one small step again to contribute to uh, a better world. For the, it's the the main reason for being an academician. Uh, what is before us if are, of course, global challenges of what is likely to be uh, uh, of hitherto unseen dimensions. Then this here, this well-known image, again, the 2030, uh, points to a number of these challenges, of course. But secondly, and more concretely, we are here because of future urbanisms, which is a long-term multidisciplinary research and collaboration program that we have just started up here in Campus Gotland, and we start off from precisely this image. Um, this is a, a significant change in the perspectives on what we are talking about. What we see here is not this, this three-piece cake of the Brundtland Commission, sections like cut off from each other or, or, may, or positioned together, but any three, the three-section cake is not that. 
it's not either the four piece cake which came after, which includes also culture dimension beside the social and the environmental and the economic. It's, no, it's not that. This is different. So look at this grid uh, again and take a, a careful look to look at it. It's not as sectors, not as a rectangular cake cut in different pieces, but instead as a window or windows to one and the same global totality as maybe as perspectives on this or aspects. And note the many windows to social and cultural issues such as health, equi equity, poverty, education. Note especially SDG 11, which deals with sustainable cities and communities, and then also especially SDG number 17, which talks about global partnership based on multi-actor perspective. This is precisely why we are here, to try to take a small step towards such a global partnership based on collaboration between all kinds of actors, all sorts of people, in search for solutions to urgent large-scale problems, and there are indeed such uh, problems to deal with. While the public debate has long been occupied with climate change and carbon dioxide, dioxide emissions for quite some time, there are also other issues. Um, Johan Rockström and his college, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, some of you might have seen this before, of course, they have identified and quantified a number of planetary boundaries that together define what they name, phrase them as uh, um, operating, safe operating space for humanity. The idea uh, is that in order to avoid disastrous consequences, these boundaries must not be transgressed. But four of the nine planetary boundaries, uh, climate change, loss of biosphere integrity, land system change, altered biochemical cycles, especially phosphorus and here uh, also in Gotland, very uh, important nitrogen. Uh, Rockstrom and the, the, his colleagues note that they have already, four of them have already been crossed as a result of human activity. And two of these, climate change and biosphere integrity, are what the authors call core boundaries. Significantly Significantly altering either of these would drive the Earth system into a new state where, where we don't know where we will get. Transgressing a boundary in, will increase the risk that human activities could drive the Earth system into a much less hospitable place. And will, it will jeopardize the efforts to reduce poverty and leading to loss of human life space in many parts of the world, including our part of the world. And the conclusion to be drawn from this is that even though staying within the safe operating space for all the nine boundaries, it's important, uh, the, even if that is important, it is now of vital importance to reduce human negative impact on biodiversity, climate change, nitrogen cycle, cycle and land system change. That is what this picture tries to tell us. Still, I'm, I'm environmental sustainability alone, of course, without reflection on culture and social issues will not get us where we will go, must go. What Kate Raworth, I don't know how she pronounced her name, but Rayworth or Raworth or something, Raworth maybe. Um, Kate Raworth has combined these planetary boundaries of Rockström uh, uh, and colleagues with Agenda 2030's SDGs in a model or a framework that she calls the donut model, a model that brings together the uh, Rockstrom's image of safe operating space with a number of cultural and social issues. So that what we see here is two concentric radar charts combined to visualize not only ecological but also social and cultural boundaries that together will encompass life on Earth. And the inner circles in this picture show the cultural and so social foundation for life as we know it. And below them there will be shortfalls in well-being such as hunger, ill health, illiteracy, energy, poverty, so on, so on. What we thus get here is an image of a space bounded by both environmental sustainability and human needs, which shows the, and that shows the many complex and dynamic interactions across and between uh, these multiple boundaries. It is from such a position that future ur urbanisms try to set off a long-term, broad disciplinary, multidisciplinary program for research and collaboration, centering on issues concer concerning sustainability. It's based here in Visby, precisely because it's, we are he used here to do multidisciplinary work, 
and because the campus is small, and because the tight relation to the mother planet, so to say, in the, in the mainland, that is Uppsala University, uh, the, the big one. Uh, so with its long uh, history of excellence in education and in research. To put it shortly, we'll run a program from here with a core team based here in Visby, recruit a number of call teams in different parts of the world that will collaborate closely with NGOs, communities, social enterprises uh, to research a multitude of possible solutions to glo global issues that are tried out right now as we heard also in India about uh, from the ambassador's speech here, which has tried out locally issues concerning water, food, energy, health, mobility, and so on also. And this picture shows a little bit. We can let have this underlying picture here. So using ethnographic and anthropology, anthropological methods, we will try to study these daily practices of sustainability and resilience in urban communities and groups in European and Asian cities. And we will be studying these within uh, places of work, leisure, family and friends during travel, other aspects of life, and particularly on Scandinavian and Southeast Asian cities. And uh, aiming at producing knowledge not only for academic communities or for uh, the academy, but also for policymakers, companies, institutions, and so on. The simple insight that we are starting from is that, as we heard, India's future is or will become everybody's future, if only for the mere size of the population. And also the other way around, Sweden and Gotland's future is also India's future and everybody's future. We need to find ways to deal with all those futures, all our futures, which for a majority of the world's population will mean urban futures, whether they are here, there, and everywhere, as the famous Lennon McCartney song has it. So what we will deal with is simply put future urbanisms. This is one of my most important English teachers in fifth and second grade. Uh, in one of his early albums, Highway 61 Revisited, he captures the frustration of the young generation being overlooked, neglected by urban middle-aged middle class. The refrain of one of the songs goes, some, you know that something's happening here, but you don't know what it is, do you, Mr. Jones? <laughs> and those words have re remained with me ever since, On, and today they seem more true than ever. We, yes, yes, we know that something is going, hap going on here, something's happening, but we really don't know what it is, do we? And I recognize not that I am Mr. Jones, <laughs> urban, middle-aged, middle-class. <laughs> But uh, uh, and we, it might well turn out that the Canadian writer Naomi Klein in his best -selling, her best-selling book on climate change got it right. Yes, this will change everything, as she, the book says. Taken literally, it is a truism. Change is the only thing in the world that does not change. So it's a truism. It will change, as we learn from the laws of thermodynamics. So, but to put it more precisely, what we might say that what we're now seeing is change is now somewhat changing. That is, in terms of direction, scope, speed, and scale. Our image, our visions, our notion of change must be changing. That's my uh, first point here. And it, not only in terms of climate change, but also in terms of politics, ideologies, values, forms of living. I am an ethnologist. This is my business. Uh, and what I'm doing. And all that, what we cultural research is called culture. What we see before us is how sustainability is now rapidly becoming a platform for action for, from, of course, for young people all around the world, but not only that, also other people, a platform for all kinds of actions, of reasons, aims, objectives. It has already changed a lot, and it's likely to, we will see a lot more changes in all sorts of areas. And we, as cultural researchers, as social researchers, need to follow this closely while it's happening. And not least, to look into counterproduction that also always happens. Counterproduction, that means that we are not getting where we want. So we are researchers. It's our mission to find out things, or to quote another of my heroes, Irving Goffman, the re American researcher, who says that we always need to ask the deceivingly simple question, what is going on here? That's what we're trying to do. And there is many things going on when it comes to sustainability. It's one of those words that can be used in just 
anyway for just what you like uh, would like it to stand for. But like words like peace, democracy, love, understanding, they are indicators of a direction pointing towards somewhere we must thread, although we do not know the way. What we already know is that the notion of sustainability is normative. It is a must, it's not optional. You cannot really say or hold that you don't want it. Because uh, you can debate what it means, how to approach, when, where, by whom, but there's really not an option not to go there. It's inbuilt into the notion. For that reason, we have to understand the notion of sustainability broadly, use it with care and precision. So the program here, Future Urbanism, is based on the idea that while it will be worthwhile and fruitful to approach sustainability, by it, that it will be worthwhile and fruitful to approach sustainability by following closely in the steps of common, ordinary people, uh, that the steps they are already taking, the changes that are already implemented, the innovations already made to make the world a better place. Lots of things have happened. In short, whatever sustainability studies will have to mean, they, we must handle locality and diversity and do it from a bottom-up perspective. Future Urbism is a program based on that belief. And you know, whatever that notion of sustainable will mean, that, that me, me, it must mean that also research of the humanities and the social sciences, such as us, ethnologists, folklorists, anthropologists, musicologists, archaeologists, human geograph geographers, and many more, must now step up and participate more actively in the debate on sustainability in the studies about the notions and also in a much more proactive, collaboration work to produce what we are aiming at. So what can we do for sustainability? To begin with, consider, it, uh, consider diversity seriously. A common type of thinking is to provide one-for-all solutions, top-down, a generalistic system thinking manner, uh, while we, of course, must understand and acknowledge that there are cases where no alternative exists to big systems, we also need to acknowledge that there are a large number of issues that have to be dealt with differently, confronted and solved where they appear. Diversity. Uh, diversity is a key to sustainable, uh, sustainability uh, in terms of biodiversity, social diversity, cultural diversity, and closely related to diversity is locality, since di the diverse is necessarily also, first and foremost, the local. So the problems we face may be grand in scope and scale, but they are also diverse and many, at many levels simultaneously. The kind of systems thinking that has been a cornerstone of what we know as the modern world or modernity, premiering grand scale, one for all solutions, may therefore well be a medicine that can come to kill the patient to confront issues where they appear will have to be based on other ways of thinking, a more distributive way of thinking that will acknowledge the world's fundamental diversity. And this necessarily implies an emphasis on the local, which in turn calls for bottom-up perspectives, working seriously with local communities and the many different and diverse ways of living. So again, local is not an opposite of the global, to the global. The global is dependent and constituted by the local and vice versa. In other words, India's future is our future. India's problems are our problems. And Gotland's issues are India's and the rest of the world's. Listening to experts on all the themes we aspire to cover in the program of future urbanisms, what we hear is a recurrent trope. We will need all the resources, solutions that we can find. Yes, this is the common. So the road towards any kind of future spells diversity, a multitude of regional solutions to regional issues. The world is constituted by diversity, or to be more precise, a diversity of diversities, as we learn from studying biodiversity. Diversity comes in singular, in the singular. But it, what it describes comes in pluralist tantum, which means not as many different kinds of things, but as many different kinds of different kinds of things, if you get what I'm saying here. 
So diversity comes at all levels, from the very local to the global. What we seriously have to consider is the meaning of diversity and what diversity can do for us, not how to overcome it. So that is why we are here. And to that, collaboration is an absolute prerequisite between researchers, uh, civil society, communities, businesses. And if we do take collaboration seriously, this we mean that we must take a step away from big scale, one for all systems thinking, and instead embrace the idea of many small roads taking us more efficiently to where we must go. Many small roads rather than a few big motorways. Thank you. Thank you, Uwe. Well, we also have a special guest who has uh, flown down from India. Uh, can I call on uh, Soma, please, to come here? So, so uh, Soma Banerjee is uh, the executive director and principal lead uh, on smart cities at uh, the CII in India, which is the Confederation of uh, Indian Industries, uh, sort of a body of uh, all Indian industries. So, all yours, the platform is yours. I'll load your somewhere. Uh, we need some help to put up the uh, presentation. Do you want to get started till then? Good morning, 